Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by David Wheatley. David is a leadership coach, facilitator, trainer, and principal at Humanergy, a boutique leadership development company. He is co-author of a new book called What Great Teams Do Great, How Ordinary People Accomplish the Extraordinary. This book helps leaders activate the power of choice and establish the right team processes that create excitement, shared mission, trust, and collaboration to achieve bold objectives and to have a little bit of fun along the way. And if you've heard me talk about this issue and you've been listening to this show for a while, you know I always say that leadership is all about energizing ordinary people to do extraordinary things. So I'm happy to have David on the show to talk about this important topic and this important book. So David, welcome. Oh, thank you, John. I appreciate being here. Well, I'm glad to have you, and I'm interested in about this book, and I'm, I'm curious to, to hear your, uh, you know, your, your feedback and how you came about writing this book. But first of all, I wanted to get a little bit of your origin story, because I understand that you haven't been in the leadership space your whole life. In fact, you actually started as a Scotland Yard police officer. So I'm kind of curious to know how you started there and ended up in this leadership world. Well, it's uh, origin stories are always interesting, aren't they? And uh, I, I know you've talked a lot about yours on, on your um, podcast and in the book, and we're not that dissimilar, I don't think, but my Bobby's hat is on the table behind me for <laughs> those that watch this, um, because my first career was as a, a Bobby, as you would know him over here, a, a police officer in London, and the police in London's headquarters is Scotland Yard, which most people are familiar with, so... And uh, that was my kind of uh, grounding and, and my basic training and everything was to walk the streets of London for a few years. Wow. Wow. And so did that inspire you or get you to thinking about leadership or did you have some uh, leadership story that sort of said, to, you know, maybe I need to look at this or like a bad experience or good experience, anything like that? I mean, it's interesting. Uh, um, I had a few interactions in the, the leadership development world because I, uh, as a sideline, I, I taught whitewater kayaking. Oh, uh, wow. Time in the 80s, they were doing a lot of outdoor-based leadership development. And occasionally they would call me up and say, we notice you have these bits of paper. Can you come and run the safety for our leadership development programs? And there would be 10 senior officers in kayaks on the River Thames and a facilitator and me. And, and my job was to make sure everybody knew how to kayak and nobody drowned. And the facilitator was trying to draw out leadership lessons and I, I found myself playing at being the facilitator more and more on those days. And it was inspirational in terms of, I want to do more of that. And uh -huh. there's time for me to do stuff yet. So after five years in the police, I, I left and went back to school. And, um, and yet the, the police work, kind of like you talk about in your book, about the, the Navy being a grounding for everything else you've mm. done. Um, the police work was really about paying attention, asking questions, and summarizing what you hear. Mm. And that... You know, my grounding for my leadership coaching was all found at Hendon Police College in North London. Interesting. So, yeah, I think probably you're the first one that's been on the podcast that was a former police officer that got into this business. So that's uh, very interesting. So, but I would imagine you're right. So active listening is something that is a skill set that most police officers have, I'd imagine. Yeah, you listen to what people are saying and then you summarize back what you're hearing and you try to find out what the reality is of a situation, whether it be in a road traffic accident or a burglary and things like that. But, but those those skills of pay attention and listen, uh, you know, I wasn't the world's best cop by any means. I, I think I'd be much better at it now, but uh, I'm probably too old. But uh, <laughs> those skills were a foundation that I find I lean on more and more in my coaching work. I like that. I like that a lot. So tell us about your company, uh, Humanergy. So what do you guys do and what kind of companies do you work with? Well, uh, thank you. And you got the pronunciation right. Um, <laughs> I was careful about that. <laughs> yeah, Humanergy. We're, we're actually celebrating our 21st anniversary this month. And um, so it's 21 years since my business partner and I started. We're a leadership development company, mostly in the areas of training and coaching. And we work with really small to medium-sized companies or departments and divisions of large companies. But really, it's we want to work with people who have influence on others. And mm -hmm. so we're not big enough to do enterprise work at a, a Fortune 500, uh, but we we have touched into those arenas. Uh, we've also been kicked out when the big guys come in because mm -hmm. they want to take over. But really, we've worked with people who have wanted to work with people over the last 21 years. And, uh, and that, you know, with hardly any marketing, we've managed to 
make a good career out of it. That's fantastic. I mean, my my small companies, we're at five years now, and I'm looking forward to saying we're 21 years old. So uh, I never thought I would get there personally. It's like that's, 21. Wow. So you're obviously doing some some of the right things. Uh, what, what are they? What are they? When they come to you, what are they mostly looking for when it comes to leadership development, coaching, assistance? What are, what's the main things that that kind of drive them coming to you? We, we kind of get the two extremes. There's uh, there's the enlightened people who say, "I believe in investing in people. I've heard good w- things about you folks, and I want you to come in and and help my people be even better than they already are." Mm. And then the other extreme is. I've got a problem. <laughs> and, right. uh, can you help me fix this problem? And um, and that tends to be a little bit harder, but uh, a more challenging work. But when it's when it, it works, it's more rewarding. Right. Um, and and the people at the other end, they just go and go and 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 take over bigger and bigger things because, as as you've already shared, people who can uh, tune into people and invest in their people well can get the most out of them, and and that's what we help people do. We're a bit of a catalyst. For leaders mm. to get the most out of their folks. I like that. I, one of the things that I noticed when I was looking, we were, I was doing some research before the show, is you talk about yourself being a boutique leadership development company. What is it? What do you mean by boutique? Is that basically, <laughs> are you trying to indicate that you're working with small to medium sized companies or? But it is a little bit. We, as a story of a few years ago, we, we were asked to bid for a piece of work at a large you know, pseudo government agency because we had a good relationship with some of the people in there. And we put this bid in and we made ourselves look a little bit bigger than we are. And, uh-huh. um, and we found out that we didn't get it. And when I investigated, they said, yeah, you came a very, very close second. Mm. And, and I said, oh, well, I'd love to know what we could have done differently. And, you know, I know you're not going to tell me who, who got it, but, you know, and they said, oh, yeah, we'll tell you it was McKinsey. Oh, gee. <laughs> and it's like, okay, so help us understand. And the answer was, well, my boss really liked your proposal, but he won't get fired for hiring McKinsey. Yeah, yeah. And so that's where we fit. We're not the we're not going to take over a, a like a large enterprise wide project, but where we uh, we can reach the people and touch the people, we can have an influence. So we're not the superstore; we're the boutique. I like that. That's great. And I think you know. It doesn't matter the size of your organization. There's always going to be leadership challenges and, and opportunities to get better. And especially, you know, especially smaller companies where you have a founder maybe that has an idea and then he gets going and he's got two people. And then next thing you know, he needs 10 and then 20. And suddenly leadership is a much more important thing than when he got started, right? Or he or she gets started. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that transition, because we really focused in on leadership transitions quite a lot. And that transition mm-hmm. is one of the the big ones, isn't it? I start my own organization and it goes from being what I might call a ma and pa organization right. where everybody does a bit of everything. And you've probably experienced that a little bit in your world. Yes. And then all of a sudden you become an organization where you need policies, you need right. HR, you need all these different bits and the jobs get smaller. Mm. And, and you think at a certain point, you hire up, you get the job would get bigger and it's no, you stop being the vice president of IT sales, marketing and operations. Right. right. And you start picking one of those. And, and letting go of the others is one of the big transitions of a, a founder or a leader in an organization when they have to let go of something that they own from the ground up. Yeah, and that's a big, and, and many entrepreneurs fail at that point because they're, they're used to holding on to doing everything and, and, and letting go a little bit and letting others do some of the things um, it's hard to do. And many, many small businesses struggle right at that point where they have to make that transition. So it is a difficult transition. And I kind of term it, uh, and I, I'm used to proper football, but the American football version <laughs> would be uh, quarterback to coach, yeah. because you know quite often a leadership transition goes from I'm the quarterback, I'm in the middle of everything, I'm the superstar, every play comes through me, you know I'm I'm the one that everybody's holding on their shoulders when it goes right, and then I become the coach, which is the next level up, right, in an organization, and it's no longer my job to touch the ball. Right. My job right. now is to get the team doing the right things and to start thinking about the, the mixture of the team, the end goal for the season, not just the game. And letting go of the ball and getting off the field is, again, a really hard leadership yep. transition for folks. Yeah. yeah, I can see that. That's for sure. So, um, you know, one thing in your bio, which uh, got me thinking about, and I was curious about, you say that you're the chief question asker at your company. So what does that mean? 
<laughs> well, it's uh, for those that know me will know that this is partially a joke, but uh, um, we, we've historically not had job titles in our organization. And, and it's because we told people adopt the job title that you need to best help our clients and mm -hmm. to serve the organization. So if right now you need to be the vice president of IT, be the vice president of IT, mm -hmm. because you have the judgment to make the decisions to what you want. And then a number of years ago, I noticed my business partner, John, started posting on his LinkedIn site that he was the chief insight officer for humanity. Mm. And so I kept thinking, uh, what can I be then? What, what's Because I don't want to just have a normal one. And my first thought uh, I came up with was chief humility officer. But I didn't think most people would get the joke. So, <laughs> and so I, <laughs> I, would, I ditched that one. And then I, I was talking to somebody uh, once about what we did. And I said that when I'm doing my best work, I'm asking a good question and then leaving a great pause. Mm. And so that's where I came up with my competition for chief, chief insight officer is chief question asker, because when I do my best work, that's where I do well. Mm. I love it. You know, it's, it's, I've said it in my books and I really believe in it is that when I was a young leader, when I first went into management leadership in, in, the, in, the, in the corporate world, I used to think I had to have all the answers. And, you know, now being older and having done it for 30 years, I realized that I have to have the right questions. And so that's why it resonated for me when I saw a chief question asker. I think that's my job as CEO is asking the right questions and standing back and pausing and getting a chance to hear what uh, my team has to say, you know. And, uh, you know, I think if we try to have all the answers, we're only limited to what our own, you know, experience and skill sets uh, will be. So we have to, you know, unleash our people to be able to get great things done. Yeah, and it goes back to that quarterback to coach thing, doesn't it? I have to step back and out of the way. And I was talking to a, a friend of mine, Margie Hageny, a, a few months ago, and she was identifying some research she'd read that uh, when you ask a good question, you should count to 10 slowly in your head. Mm. Because most people's thinking kicks in around second seven. Yes. And so if you wait and count to 10, and that space can be really awkward and uncomfortable, but it's amazing how many times when you do that, somebody comes up with an answer about second seven or eight that mm. is as good, if not better than the one that you might have said. And you're not getting in the way of them by asking another question at second four or five. Right, right. That's a good piece of advice. I have a problem with that. Sometimes I, <laughs> I, I don't like the awkward silence. So I want to jump in with, you know, the next question or to clarify or what have you, but you need to let let that pause, let it sit for a while. Let it resonate, yeah. It's the, there, and another friend of mine, Judy Brown, writes a poem called Fire, which if you Google Judy Brown and fire, you'll find it. it's a wonderful poem about leadership, but it's really about building a fire. And she talks about how the space between the logs is as important as the logs. Mm, and I think wow. sometimes when we, as, yeah, when we as leaders pile questions on people, all we're doing is piling logs on top of the fire. And you know what happens when you pile too many logs on the fire. Yeah. And so that space between the logs uh, idea that, that Judy shares is just such a critical piece of, of leadership learning in my mind. Wow. I've never heard that before, but uh, I'm definitely going to use that. So <laughs> that's great. Yeah. That's great. Well, quote, quote Judy Brown. And, and I will I quote you. Judy Brown. I'll look that poem up. That's fantastic. <laughs> so um, let's talk about the book because I think it's really neat. Uh, what great teams do great. So first of all, Why'd you guys write it? And because you're the, one of the co-authors, why'd you write it? And, um, you know, who's it for? Who, who's it mainly for? It's, it's written with my business partner, John Barrett, and my colleague, Christy Barrett, who does a lot of our writing for us. And, and we team together on this. It's, it's really the, the culmination of the 21 years of us working with leaders mm. and teams. It's our second book. Um, but we started to notice that... Um, some patterns in our work and, and we have a bit of an ecosystem in that we go from doing executive coaching where we'll be asking you good questions about your organization and and then working together we'll identify some patterns and then when I bring that back to my team we'll see similarities in those patterns and we'll take the rough sketches and create a, a model that will then validate over time so that the next time I come into you rather than us sketching that rough plan out I can bring out my, my model and say, well, let's mm. look at this because this is built on the backs of hundreds of leaders that have shared their experience. And uh, I was listening to one of your episodes a few episodes ago that uh, someone was talking about the, uh, the Tuckman model of forming, storming, norming, performing. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And um, 
you know, that that's useful, but only to a degree. Mm -hmm. And when you try and give that kind of thinking to a practical uh, frontline kind of leader, they're saying, so yeah, what? Uh, <laughs> and so we said, well, what if we took our learning and kind of plugged it into that same kind of thinking, what would the practical advice be? So, so we, we put our heads together and came up with the, the model. We've been training the model for a while. We decided to write the book a couple of years ago and we brought it out just in time for COVID to hit. Um, <laughs> right. Even though our marketing plan was to get out and do, you know, speaking tours at conferences and things like that. So, right, right. But when it comes down to the pieces of it, and you know, I, I encourage folks to go out and have a look at the, the book, which is available from all good bookstores, et cetera. <laughs> but, uh, there's some key things that, you know, I won't go into the whole model, we'll be here all night, but one thing that great teams do differently is they take time to set themselves up right mm. and what i mean by that is get to know each other and what they bring to the table make sure that they understand the current environment and what the external forces are on that environment uh, make sure that they're all aligned as to what they're trying to achieve and mm. why and then what are their non-negotiables for working together mm. the limited number of absolutes that they put in place that setup phase uh, is quite often skipped over or skimmed because people want to get into doing the work of coming up with a plan. Right. And that moment in time to stop and say, no, let's just check this. Even if it's a quick emergency, let's just take the time to just skim through these questions is a difference maker. Mm. Uh, the, the second of, of three key difference makers we found in this model is when we come across issues, how we address those issues can take it for better or worse. And we use the idea of a red path and a green path. And each choice we make is laying a brick on our life path. And what we want to be doing is to look back at our path and see that it's mostly green. And what I mean by a green choice is one that is greater good focused and is taking us forward because it's about understanding, it's about engagement, and it's about a forward focused solution. What I mean when I say a red path choice is quite often when it's attack, avoid, blame, defensiveness, excuses, whining. Those are all examples of what I would call red path choices, which make the issue worse, as opposed to the green path choices, which make the issue better. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is how we look at our learning, which is that the first of our learning cycles, what we call our discipline cycle, just simply asks the question, are we doing what we said we were going to do? And again, that's something that, that quite often teams will skip over. And I actually have um, one client that was struggling with this for a while. It seemed like uh, they would have issues. And the first thing they do is change the team. Yeah. And, and that is the third question that we say you should ask, because it, the first one is, are we doing what we said we were, we were going to do? And if we aren't, then let's start doing it, because mm. it was probably a good plan. If we are doing it and it's not working, then it, was it a good plan? And if not, then let's come up with a better plan. And only then, if we come up with all the best plans we can, maybe we need to look at the team and our alignment to what success is. So I like that. One thing that you really stood out when you when you started out, you talk about just getting to know each other. And that seems to be, how do I say this? Uh, work, having worked on many teams in 22 years in corporate, um, that's something we did, never did very well. Like, <laughs> you know, when I was on a team, right? It was always... You've been you've been asked to be here for this reason. Here's the goal. You know, yep. here's the mission. And you know, we didn't ask. You know, we didn't go around the room saying, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're here. Right? I mean, it seemed like that would be an important thing. Um, when I look back at my background as a submarine officer, that's I think one of the main advantages we had is we really knew each other, and that's because we spent months together in a you know a metal tube. You know. Uh, standing watch together in the same spaces. So officers and enlisted, we stay, we were in the same spaces for six hours at a time, standing watch. So I knew my people very deeply. I knew everything about them. I knew if they were married or the single, or if they had a girlfriend or they, you know, what kind of food they liked. I mean, I knew my people intimately because we were so close to each other and we spent a lot of time together. And I always thought that was an advantage in being able to lead people is actually know them and know, know how they tick. Yet I see a lot of times in corporate, in my 22 years in corporate, kind of just the opposite. Like, I don't want to get to know you. I'm the boss. I'm going to stay over here. I'm going to be sort of uh, apart from you. I'll have my office with a door. You'll be over here in a cubicle or out in a manufacturing plant. 
and uh, I'm separated and we're not together. And I think that was, um, I think it's a big mistake when you have that separation between the leader and the people, you know, trying to accomplish the mission. I think that's uh, getting to know people and being intimate, I think is an important part of, you know, good leadership. Yeah, I, I agree. And, I, and it doesn't mean you have to go spend seven months underwater with each other. <laughs> Please don't. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I can't imagine that at all. But the uh, it, it's the matter of getting to know each other well enough to know what makes each other tick, what each other brings to the table, where your skill set is, et cetera. And, and it's even more important in our remote world mm, because yes. there's so many teams that are working remotely and they're taking all that for granted. And, and yet there's so many simple things you can do just to explore who people are and how they think. Uh, and one of the, uh, my favorites recently is just ask a simple question at the beginning of every meeting. Mm. So it's going to take the first five minutes. We're going to ask a silly question. We're going to take it in turns to come up with the silly question. But the idea of the question should be that it helps peel away the layers of people so we get to know them a little bit better, but mm. without going into such intimate detail that we have to have their life story. Right, right. Uh, and one of my favorite questions at the moment is, if, if you came with a warning label, what would it be? <laughs> Oh, gee, I like that. <laughs> I'm just, afraid to ask that question. Some, yeah. some of my employees. <laughs> but, but if you imagine asking your team that tomorrow, just in the, the fun that that would be for two minutes as people came up with silly things. And even if they weren't so silly, it was just a matter of, you know, quiet. Right. You know, that, that's right. right. And then it's helping people get to know and have a little bit of fun with each other in a way that helps them build the, the bonds that work when you're in crisis. I mean, that's one of the advantages you had underwater was you knew how each other was going to react. Right, right. So that when the excretion met the cooling system, you could, <laughs> yes. you could respond appropriately. Yes, absolutely. You know, I like what you talked about, this idea of a red path and, and a green path. I've never heard that before, but I really like it. And, um, you know, if I reflect back on my years in corporate, there was a lot of times I seem like we at least the, a lot of the managers I worked for would always kind of go down the red path for most things. So it was always, who do we blame? Um, how do we protect our, our, uh, you know, our job? How do we, you know, you know, focus the, everyone's attention in a different direction? Uh, it just seemed like it, it wasn't that green path kind of decisions. There, were, there was too much of it, unfortunately. Um, you know, a lot of managers trying to cover their their backside and trying to keep their job and and nobody nobody being really honest about things. And and so I would imagine if you go down, uh, if you make more of your decisions heading down a green path, it's going to be a place where people like to come to work because you're doing things for the right reason. You're going after a goal. You're on a mission. Everybody's in it together, uh, you know, trying to achieve the objective, you know, in, in, in working together to get there and making the best decision for the team, for the organization, not just for the leader or for, you know, the dollar, you know, amount that you're to the profit at the end of the end of the month. Oh, yeah. How many times have you seen an organization that that said, you know, told people not to worry about making mistakes? Right. The first mistake they made, they were made fun of, the, the things were protected, things were thrown in their direction and everything else. So, so the culture didn't match what people were saying. Right. And so what we're seeing with a number of our organizations is they're really adopting a green path culture. One that says we are going to be forward focused. We'll still hold people accountable, but we'll do it in a way that drives us in the right direction and mm -hmm. that helps people grow or helps us relocate people to jobs that are better suited to, to their skill set right, they bring right. to the table. But this, this list of red path behaviors, and, and I say to people, if you're doing any of these things, you're part of the problem. Mm. And I go through them, attack, avoid, blame, accommodate, uh, ignore, yeah. defensiveness, the deflection that you talked about, excuses, whining. If you're doing any of those, you're part of the problem. Wow, that's good. I like that. So you talk in um, you talk about how leadership is about the choices we make. What do you mean by that? So the the I believe that any choice you make that impacts or influences the people around you is a leadership choice. Mm. Now, doesn't mean that all of them are good leadership choices. That you can have destructive leadership choices because you're influencing people poorly. But if you, if you think that way, that every choice you make that influences somebody else is a leadership choice, then we're all making leadership choices on a daily basis. Mm. And it, you know, you're the CEO of your company. You're making leadership choices that influence the whole company. You've got a new employee who didn't start very long ago, and he or she is making leadership choices 
on a daily basis in your company uh, because they're choices that they make that influence the people around them. And so if we know that we're all making that, we know we're all leaders in that way, then we know we can choose to either make choices on the green path or the red path. Yeah. And, and then when you match those two things up, you get people believing at all levels of the organization that the choices I can make can have a greater influence on the greater good, even though I have no authority, no power, no rank, none of that. And it really links in, we were talking about you know, good stories from submariners, as I would call it. Right. Uh, um, one of your former colleagues, I'm sure David Marquette, talks yes. about pushing the uh, authority down to where the information's at. Yes. Because you want them to be able to make good leadership choices. Right. And you think, but that's that's a, a very lowly rank, but they're making choices on a daily basis that are influencing the rest of the ship. And so you want them to be great leadership choices. No, 100%. And, you know, I talk about that in my new book, too, is that, you know, um, we were all in it together, right? So in one, it didn't matter what your rank was, one sailor, even the most junior sailor makes a mistake, everyone could perish, right? So there was this shared uh, vulnerability, but there was also shared accountability. Like, so we, so the choices you make didn't just affect you, it affected your shipmates, right? And their ability to, you know, accomplish the mission and get home safely, Right. Mm -hmm. And so we truly were in it together. I mean, uh, the name of the book is all on the same boat, but we literally were all in the same boat. And uh, and the enemy was not just the you know, I was a Cold War sailor, not just the Soviet Union, but it was the, you know, thousands of pounds of pressure, sea pressure surrounding the submarine that wanted to crush us. And so our job was to stay alive and to prevent that from happening. We needed to work together to accomplish the mission. And I think what I found in, in corporate culture somewhat is that there wasn't that we we're working together to accomplish a goal. It was everybody sort of working uh, towards their own individual career aspirations uh, or their own bonus plan or, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it was, it wasn't, we weren't all in it together. It didn't feel like it. And so when I ran my organization, I always made sure that we, we felt like we were all in it together. We, we had one objective as a team to, to, you know, to accomplish something that, that was big and, and something that was, uh, I like in your, in your book's uh, vernacular, something that was extraordinary, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and making sure that everyone knew what that extraordinary goal was and that we were working towards it every day. And um, you've, got a, you've got a great example in that boat because, I mean, you can't get off. Nope. <laughs> and and, and if, if one person makes what I would call a red path choice, Yes. It's not going to be the captain that holds them accountable for that. It's going to be their shipmates. Everybody on the, the boat. Yeah. Directly next to them. It doesn't matter what the rank, what they're, right. they're going to be the ones that say, no, 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 you can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. And put them right and help them understand why they can't do that. Right. So that then it's for the betterment of the, the greater good. And I think the, the more teams recognize that and the more teams recognize the choices that every individual makes, the more you get everybody on the team pulling in the same direction. Yes. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, that's great. So what are some of the, uh, you mentioned some of the frontline leadership, you know, do's and don'ts. What are some of those that for our listeners? Well, that's actually our first book. But, that's, uh, but that's, I uh, think going back to that first book, so what are some of those do's and don'ts? So um, that's simpler. Our first book was actually a much more of a reference than a read. Uh, and it, it comes from um, somebody saying that they uh, they kept losing frontline leaders in a manufacturing environment mm. and um because the very tenured workforce was chewing them up and spitting out and uh he said i wish i could have the blueprint that gave them do this and don't do that and you'll be su successful for long enough to know why mm. and to survive and so we we interviewed a, a hundred or so very experienced supervisors and said what what is that blueprint and after we'd had lots of good conversation, we whittled it down to 50. And it's 50 pairs uh, that have things like, you know, number one is uh, be 100% honest versus the don't, which is spin and tell half truths. <laughs> and, you know, what you want is to be 100% honest. Right. And, and even when people ask that question and say, do we really mean that? And it's like, yes. And they say, well, what if, what if I can't say anything? It's like, well, then you tell them you can't tell them. Right. Because they're still 100% honest. You don't avoid it or spin and things like that or lie. Be honest. And if you do that, 
then you will build the enough trust and rapport to be able to lead them and to know when you can even break those rules. Mm. And, the, and the challenge with 50 is it seems like a lot, you know, um, but when people look through the 50, they're doing most of the, the good stuff well. It's just a one or two that, that they suddenly trip over and say, oh, I should probably do more of that. <laughs> and, and the idea of the, the 50 do's, which is our, our first book, 50 do's for everyday leadership, is pick the one or two that you need to be focused on now bend the spine back and open it up and leave that on the front of your desk to remind yourself of just to remind of yourself that. yeah and then yeah. when you think you've got that go back to the list of 50 and work out which is the next one that's going to trip you up mm. and uh, and so it's really 50 very practical do this don't do that and then it has a little explanation of why and why those are important on each page as well how does that how would you say that dovetails into the new book in terms of making uh the right choices for the people around you, but also, you know, trying to stay on that green path. Is it, is, is, is if you do the do's and don'ts correctly, are you heading in the right, are you heading down the right green path? Are they related? Well, it's, it's funny because we, we wrote the 50 do's for everyday leadership in 2007, eight time. And um, we put on the front of it, a traffic light mm. um, because we wanted that green and red thing and that the do's are green and the don'ts yeah, are red. Right, right. And so it marries perfectly with the, the 50, with the what great teams do great, because leadership in, in that is you do the green stuff, you don't do the red stuff, you'll be right. in good shape. And right. it comes back to those green choices, and green path choices every time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I just, what you, what you just said reminded me of something that uh, one of the things they taught us in the Navy was, you know, as a leader, you should learn from everything, every other leader that you work for in, in your career, right? And it, and it, I was just thinking about the greens and the reds and you learn, and they always told us to, you know, emulate the things that you admired about the leaders mm -hmm. you work for that were great leaders and, and they did the things right. And you're like, that should go in your head as to what you should do. And then the leaders that you work for that had a lot of problems or, or, or you, you, you know, you responded negatively to that kind of leadership is to never do those things, to put that in your head as a, as a red light, never to do those things. Yeah. And if you do that over a career and, you know, for all our listeners are listening in, if you do that over a career, you're going to become a better leader just by how you react to the people that you're working for and those little red and green lights. Uh, Cause I think you can see leaders going down a red path. It's, it's especially now if you, as you pointed out what those characteristics look like, you see that, and if you're someone working for that boss, you feel it. Like I don't like what she just yeah. did or what he just did, right? So um, yeah, so that red and green is a great analogy for even learning your own leadership style based on observing other leaders around you. We do an exercise when we we train the fifty do's on that that says think of the best leader you've ever experienced. Oh, I love that. And think of the worst leader you've ever experienced, and now measure them against the do's and don'ts. Mm. Uh, and uniformly, people will come up and say the best leader does just about all of the do's, but maybe an occasional don't, but they get away with it because they do so much of the do's. And then yeah. completely the opposite for the worst leader they've experienced. Yeah, I agree. You know, it's interesting, just what you said made me think of, you know, like if you're if you're a good leader and you're doing mostly mostly the right things and people respect you and you're honest and you're forthright and you're you've built a team. Sometimes when you're going to make a mistake, right, mm -hmm. and you get the benefit of the doubt, if you've been doing, you know, 90% right, and you're 90% on that green path, if you do make a red path decision, I think your team is much more forgiving than if you're always, than you're 90% red and, you know, 10% green, right? I think people, and I would say that about my career, my my teams have always been very forgiving when I do make a mistake. And I'm always first to admit, yeah, that was wrong. I shouldn't have went in that direction. But I think, um, yeah, I think you you get a little more forgiveness if you're, you tend to be doing the right things most of the time. Yeah. Well, we all use the term investing in our people. Mm. And if you take that to the financial piece, it's, it has the equivalent of a credit rating. So if, oh, we invest like in our, if we invest in our people in a green path way, we have credit. Yes. And, and we can afford to screw up from time to time. And yes. we will we will get grace if we don't invest in our people in the right way, or if we invest in them in a red path way, then we don't have credit. And it's the I'm sure you felt this in the in the navy as well that there were some people when you saw a leader going down the red path, you distanced yourself from them. Right, right. And, and if they were to say jump later on, you would just hesitate. Right, 
because right. you weren't quite sure whether it was the right thing. Whereas the those leaders that had invested green path wise with you, if they said jump, you just jump. Right. There's even, trust. Even, yeah. yeah. There's trust built up. Yeah. Even if you would expect them to have explained the why, you know that they've got credit to not have to explain the why this time mm. um, because they've built that credit over time. I like that. It makes a lot of sense. So how can people find out, uh, where, where can they go to find out more about your company and your new book and well, the old uh, book too, for both books. <laughs> the old book you pull out. So um, and thank you for that. Uh, humanergy.com and uh, make sure you spell it right. It's, it's <laughs> you, humanergy.com uh, is where you can find out most of this information. Uh, both books are available on the book section of that. And uh, what's interesting, if for your listeners, just special uh, today as well, we wrote eight chapters in What Great Teams Do Great last year, and then have since written two more. Oh wow! And and unfortunately, the publisher won't let us, you know, stick them in the back of the book at this <sighs> time. And so we've um, we've made them available in different ways. So chapter nine which addresses um, what great teams do great race and power. Mm. And, and this came on the back of wow. a United Way group that I was working with that said, we, we love what great teams do great. And we don't think you've addressed race and the power dynamic, how you could have done. Interesting. Like, wow, what great feedback. And so we sat down with her in particular and, and a number of EDI professionals and said, what would this look like? And wrote chapter nine. And wow. you can download that from humanity.com. Okay. And chapter 10, we wrote, and you'll never guess what this is on in, in April of 2021, but uh, what's it look like virtually? What great teams do great. Ah, that's great. And um, if, if your listeners want to send me a note, and my email address is david at humanity.com, I will send them chapter 10. Okay. And I, uh, I encourage them to read the rest of the book first. But, um, Chapter 10 is just a virtual version of what great teams do great. Oh, I think that's great. That's really timely. We had uh, our last guest uh, was just talked about uh, virtual, how to get the most out of virtual meetings and uh, which was really good, but it is a huge uh, dynamic shift. Um, and uh, you know, there's pluses and minuses, minus, minuses, but there are, there are some good things about virtual life as well. And that's yeah. what we kind of hit on last week. But um, yeah, I think there's, there's a lot to learn there. And um, especially when you switch to virtual things, things change, right? I mean, you're in a way, if people are working from home, you're, you're peering into their, their homes, their, their, their personal lives a lot more than you would say in a workplace. So yeah, there's definitely, definitely different dynamics in play. And it's easier to be disconnected. Yes. So, um, and to miss the organic conversation. So mm. there's some great tips in, in there. And uh, I haven't, I listened to the previous two. I haven't uploaded your latest one, but I'm, I'm going to match it with our work. Uh, I'm also going to steal your wonderful idea of if you think you've got a bad leader, I'll send you a book for free. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll send the book anonymously. I, I think that's well, an outstanding idea. You know, it's funny, I, uh, David, I, I struggle with this one thing is that I think the great leaders are always learning, right? And they're, and they're, and they're reading books and they're listening to podcasts and they're trying to become better at their craft. It's the, it's the, the people that are sick that need the doctor, right? And so, and, and I've, I struggle sometimes to say, how do I get my book or my podcast or the things I write in the hands of the people that need it the most, you know? And so that's my way of doing it. And we've sold quite a fit of, uh, quite a bit of books to bad leaders. And uh, we just are very encouraging. And we say, you know, this is from your team. And, you know, we look forward to, you know, come, come talk to me if you have any questions, but we, we, um, it's been a fun way to try to get the book into the hands of people that really need to read it. So I think it's a, a wonderful idea. And, and the other place that people can find more about me is I, like you, everybody has a podcast these days, the Humanity Leadership Podcast, where okay. uh, we talk to leadership thought leaders and try and find really practical advice for people to use today. Okay, we'll put the links to all those resources in the show notes so everybody can get to it. So, um, but that's uh, really powerful. So the book is uh, What Great Teams Do Great, How Ordinary People Accomplish the Extraordinary. There's a copy of it for those watching on YouTube. And I encourage everyone to go out there and get it. And uh, if you're a great leader, you're going to find ways to get ordinary people to do extraordinary things. That's the whole definition of leadership. So David, I really appreciate you being on the show and sharing all of your uh, wisdom and uh, just all your insight that you've had from all those years of uh, training leaders. I really appreciate you being on the show. I appreciate the opportunity, John, and I look forward to reading your new book too. All right. Sounds good. Thanks very much. 
Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well. Thank you.